Chapter 7 Virtuality Inflating a Hollow World Quote Many, many separate arguments, all very strong individually, suggest that the very notion of space time is not a fundamental one. Space time is doomed. There is no such thing as space time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. That's very startling because what physics is supposed to be about is describing things as they happen in space time. So if there is no space time, it's not clear what physics is about. By Nima Arkani Ahmed, Cornell Messenger Lecture, 2016. There is no spoon. Spoon boy, the Matrix. Science can demystify the exotic. This talent leads to new technology, from cell phones to satellites, which can seem, in the words of author C. Clarke, indistinguishable from magic. Science can also mystify the mundane. It can plunge us without warning down a rabbit hole of the curious and curiouser. For instance, I see a spoon sitting now on the table over there. This is so commonplace that I am not tempted to give it a moment's thought. But here, where I don't expect it, science injects a profound mystery. We still don't understand now and there. That is, we don't understand time and space, length, width and depth, which we take for granted, which are woven into the very fabric of our daily perceptions, and which we assume are a true and reliable guide to physical reality. What we do understand, many physicists now tell us, is that space-time is doomed. Space and time figure centrally in our daily perceptions, but even their sophisticated union into space-time, forged by Einstein, cannot be part of a true description of the fundamental laws of nature. Space-time and all the objects it contains will disappear in that true description. Nobel laureate David Gross, for instance, observed, under quotes, everyone in string theory is convinced that space-time is doomed, but we don't know what it's replaced by. Closed quotes. Phil's medalist Edward Witten has also suggested that space time may be doomed. Under quotes. Nathan Siebel of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton said, under quotes, I am almost certain that space and time are illusions. These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Closed quotes. This is deeply unsettling. As Nima Arkani Hamid explained in the chapter's opening quote, on the course, what physics is supposed to be about is describing things as they happen in space and time. So, if there is no space time, it's not clear what physics is about. Close quotes. For physicists, this is wonderful news. To recognize the failure of a theory, no matter how dear that theory may be, is progress. Replacing the theory of space time with something more fundamental is an exciting challenge for creative theorists and has the potential to transform our vision of the world perhaps telling us for the first time what physics is really about. My goal in this chapter is a tad less ambitious. The news that space-time is doomed and objects with it does not yet inform current theories of visual perception. Instead, these theories typically assume that objects in space and time are fundamental in physical reality and that visual perception normally recovers true properties of these pre-existing objects. Current theories of perception often disagree about which true properties are reported and about how the reports are generated, but they all assume to be true what physicists have discovered to be false, that objects in space-time are fundamental. I will briefly discuss the standard theories of perception and then propose a new slant on our perception of space-time and objects. The new perspective is motivated by ITP and the holographic principle the momentous discovery discussed in chapter 6, that the amount of data you can store in a region of space depends on the area surrounding that region, not on its volume. This new outlook on space-time and objects flow from the idea that our perceptions have evolved to encode fitness payoffs and to guide adaptive behavior. Somehow, space-time and objects do just that. But how? I propose that they do it in part by data compression and error correction of fitness information. First, let's look at data compression. A fitness payoff function can be complex, and many fitness payoff functions are typically relevant to my survival, so the amount of information about fitness that's pertinent to me could be enormous, overwhelming if I had to see it all. I need it compressed to a size I can manage. 
Suppose you want to email a vacation photo to a friend, but the image is too large for your server. You compress the image and check that it still looks good. If it doesn't, if you can see that it's your family posing by the Grand Canyon, then you compress it less. You look for a happy trade-off, compressed enough to send, but not so compressed that it's not worth sending. Space-time and objects are, for human vision, that happy trade-off. Fitness payoff functions can vary in hundreds of dimensions. Human vision, shared by eons of natural selection, compresses them into three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, and into objects with shapes and colors. I can't handle hundreds of dimensions, but I can handle a few. This compression no doubt omits some information about fitness. I don't, for instance, see the millions of muons that streak through my body each day, damaging it with ionizing radiation. But I do see enough information about fitness to survive and raise offspring. We see objects in three dimensions, not because we reconstruct objective reality, but because this is the format of a compression algorithm that evolution happened to build into us. Other species may have other data formats for representing fitness. We live and move and have our being not in an objective reality of space-time and objects, but in a data structure with a format of space-time and objects, which happened to evolve in Homo sapiens to represent fitness payoffs in a manner that is frugal and useful. Our perceptions are encoded in this data structure, but we mistakenly believe that its space-time format is the objective reality in which we live. This mistake is understandable and even excusable. Our data format constraints, not just how we see, but how we think. It's not easy to step outside its confines and even to recognize that this may be possible. Waking up to this possibility has a long pedigree in intellectual and religious culture. There is much to explore about space-time and objects as compressed encodings of fitness payoffs. For instance, what aspect of fitness is captured by space and what by objects? How do shapes, colors, textures, and motions arise in the compression of fitness? Why does the compression of fitness lead us to have perceptions that are formatted in different modalities? Vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch? Perhaps distances in space encode costs of acquiring resources. An apple that costs few calories to acquire may appear just a meter away, while an apple that costs far more calories may appear much farther away. A predator may appear more distant the more calories it must expend to get me. Recent experiments support this idea. For instance, Dennis Prophet and his collaborators found that people given a drink containing glucose make shorter estimates of distance than those given a drink containing no carbohydrates and instead artificial sweetener. People who are more aerobically fit make shorter estimates of distance than those who are less fit. This suggests that our perception of a distance depends not just on the energy cost, but rather on the ratio of the energy cost to our available energy. Let's turn to error correction for a moment. When we bank or buy online, valuable data shoots across the internet. To prevent its theft by hackers, we encrypt it. But another problem is just as important, noise. Suppose you spend $60 to buy flowers online for mom. Later you learn that noise on the net slipped two decimals, and you in fact spend $6,000. An expensive mistake. If such mistakes are common, commerce online would halt. To prevent them, data are formatted in an error correcting code before being sent. A key to detecting and correcting errors is redundancy. A simple example is repetition. Suppose that you want to send four bits of data, such as the bit string 1101. You could send it three times in succession, 1101, 1101, 1101. The receiver checks that all three transmissions agree. If so, then she concludes that there is no error. But if one transmission differs from the others, then she detects an error. She can ask for another transmission or assume that the two strings that agree are correct. There are many clever ways to add redundancy, such as embedding messages into higher dimensional spaces. But the key point is that our senses convey messages about fitness payoffs and getting the right message are critical to survival. Sleep a decimal about fitness and you may sleep from life to death. We should expect that natural selection has built redundancy into our perceptual interface. 
that it has shaped our desktop of space-time and our icons of physical objects to be redundant codes for fitness payoffs that permit detection and correction of errors. This is exactly what Bekenstein and Hawking discovered about space-time. It is redundant. Two dimensions contain all the information in any 3D space. This is well-established holographic principle of Susskind and T. Hooft that we discussed in the last chapter. It is counterintuitive and belies our assumption that 3D space is an objective reality that our senses reconstruct. But it makes sense if you assume that our senses report fitness and need redundancy, such as an extra dimension of space, to ensure that their reports aren't crippled by noise. Physicists have confirmed the prediction of natural selection that space is redundant. But have they also confirmed that in fact this redundancy of space underwrites an error correcting code? That effort is underway and looks promising. The physicists Ahmed Al-Meheri, Shi Dong and Daniel Harlow find that the redundancy of space revealed by the holographic principle reflects properties of an error correcting code that protects against erasure of data by noise. As they put it, under quotes, the holographic principle also naturally arises in the guise of the general statement that there is an upper bound on how much quantum information a given code can protect from erasures. Closed quotes. The physicists John Preskill, Daniel Harlow, Fernando Pastawiski, and others have discovered specific ways that the geometry of spacetime can be interpreted as a quantum error correcting code. The picture that emerges is that space-time and objects are a code used by our senses to report fitness. Like any decent code, it uses redundancy to counter noise. This picture is precisely ITP, with the extra insight that the interface compresses data and resists noise. This picture is not endorsed by most vision scientists. Instead, they assume that vision is veridical, that it reconstructs real objects in space-time. This assumption is spelled out in the Encyclopedia Britannica entry on space perception by Louis Jolion West, former psychiatrist-in-chief at the UCLA hospital and clinics. West tells us in his entry that veridical perception is, under quotes, the direct perception of stimuli as they exist. Without some degree of veridicality concerning physical space, one cannot seek food, flee from enemies, or even socialize. Veridical perception also causes a person to experience changing stimuli as if they were stable. Even though the sensory image of an approaching tiger grows larger, for example, one tends to perceive that the animal's size remains unchanged. Closed course. Vision scientists don't claim, of course, that perception is always veridical. They admit that it can distort reality by using heuristics. But they assume that veridicality is the goal and is normally attained. They argue, for instance, that symmetries in our perceptions of objects reveal symmetries in objective reality. The vision scientist Zygmunt Pislow spells this out. Under quotes, Consider the shapes of animal bodies. Most, if not all of them, are mirror symmetrical. How do we know that they are mirror symmetrical? Because we see them as such. Seeing a mirror symmetrical object as mirror symmetrical is not possible unless the two symmetrical halves are perceived as having identical shapes. Now, note that this is remarkable because, number one, we only see the front visible surfaces of each of the two halves, and two, we see the two halves from viewing directions that are 180 degrees apart. Unless shape constancy is a real phenomenon, and unless it is close to perfect, we would not even know that symmetrical shapes actually exist. Closed course. We can recast this as a precise claim. Any symmetry in our perceptions entails a corresponding symmetry in objective reality. Is this claim true? Here we don't need hunches. We need a theorem. And, the, and we have one. The, under quotes, invention of symmetry theorem which I conjectured and Chetan Prakash proved, reveals that the claim is false. This theorem states that symmetries in our perceptions entail nothing about the structure of objective reality. The proof is constructive. It shows precisely how perceptions and actions can enjoy a symmetry, such as translation, rotation, mirror, and Lorentz, in a world that lacks any symmetry. This raises an obvious question. We see many objects with symmetries, 
Why? If symmetries in perception don't reveal symmetries of reality, then why should we see symmetry at all? The answer, once again, is data compression and error correction. Their algorithms and data structures often involve symmetries. A surfeit of fitness information can be compressed to a feasible level using symmetries. To get a feel for this, consider looking at an apple. How will it look if you move a little to the left? You can answer this using symmetry, a simple rotation and translation. Rather than store millions of numbers per view, you need just five, three for translation and two for rotation. Symmetries are simple programs that we use to compress data and correct errors. The symmetries in our perceptions reveal how we compress and encode information and not the nature of objective reality. But you might object, we can build computer vision systems that drive cars and see the same shapes and symmetries that we do. Doesn't this demonstrate that we and the computers are seeing reality as it is? Not at all. The invention of symmetry theorem applies to any perceptual system, whether biological or machine. The symmetries a computer sees entail nothing about the structure of objective reality. We can build a robot that sees the symmetries we see, but this grants us no insight into the structure of the world. Pizlo offers an evolutionary rationale for veridical perceptions of objects and space. Under course, it is not possible to conceive the successful evolution of animals and the success of their natural selection without providing for planning and purposive behavior. Closed course. He argues that our success in hunting, planting, and harvesting depends on the planning and coordination which require veridical perception of objective reality. Planning and coordination are critical to our success, but do they require a veridical representation of objective reality? No, according to the FBT theorem. Indeed, online games such as Grand Theft Auto let players collaborate toward ignoble goals such as robbing stores or stealing cars. Their plans are informed not by veridical perceptions of transistors and network protocols, but by a fake world of fast cars and tempting targets. The arguments for veridical perception fail, but it is still the standard theory in vision science. According to this theory, there really are 3D objects in space-time with objective properties such as shape that exist even when no one looks. When you look at an apple, light bouncing off its surface gets focused by the optics of your eye onto a 2D retina. This optical projection of the apple onto your 2D retina loses information about the 3D shape and depth. So your visual system analyzes its 2D information and figures out the apple's true 3D shape. It recovers or reconstructs the information lost by the optical projection. Sometimes this recovery process is called inverse optics and sometimes Bayesian estimation. Proponents of embodied cognition, under course, building on the ideas of psychologist James Gibson, push back on this story. They say that we are physical beings with real bodies that interact with the real physical world and that our perceptions are intimately linked with our actions. Perception and bodily action must be understood together. When I see a red apple, I am not simply solving an abstract problem of inverse optics or Bayesian estimation. I see a 3D shape that is tightly coupled to my actions, how I move toward it, grasp it, and eat it. Most vision scientists who subscribe to inverse optics or Bayesian estimation agree that action and perception are intimately linked. Proponents of, on the quotes, radical embodied cognition claim not just that perception and action are linked, but also that perception requires no processing of information. The interplay of perception and action can be understood, they claim, without invoking computations and representations. This radical view has few devotees and is at odds with the claim of quantum physicists that all physical processes are information processes and that no information is ever destroyed. It is also at odds with the truism that any system that undergoes a sequence of state transitions can be interpreted as a computer, perhaps a dumb one, but a computer nonetheless. ITP disagrees with the claim of standard and embodied theories that perception is veridical, but it agrees that perception and action are closely linked. Our perceptions evolve to guide adaptive exploration and action. My icon of an apple guides my choice of whether to eat as well as the grasping and biting actions by which I eat. My icon of poison ivy guides my choice not to eat. 
as well as the steps I take to avoid any contact. ITP makes a counterintuitive claim about causality. The appearance of causal interactions between physical objects in space-time is a fiction, a useful fiction, but a fiction nonetheless. I see a cue ball hit an eight ball into a corner pocket. I assume naturally that the cue ball caused the eight ball to careen to the corner, but strictly speaking, I'm wrong. Space-time is simply a species-specific desktop, and physical objects are icons on the desktop. Or, as we have just been discussing, space-time is a communications channel, and physical objects are messages about fitness. If I drag an icon to the trash can and its file gets deleted, it's often helpful, though mistaken, for me to think that the movement of the icon to the trash can literally caused the file to be deleted. Indeed, the ability to predict the consequences of one's actions through this kind of pseudo cause and effect relationship reasoning is a sign of a well-designed interface. This prediction of ITP that the appearance of causal interactions between physical objects in space-time is a fiction has interesting support from quantum computations that lack causal order. Normally, we compute one step at a time in a specific causal order. I might, for instance, start with the number 10, divide it by 2, and then add 2 to get the result 7. If I reverse the order, if I add 2 and then divide by 2, I get the result 6. The order of the operations matters. But computers have now been built in which there is no definite causal order of operations. Instead, the computer uses a superposition of causal orders, resulting in more efficient computation. The interface theory predicts that physical causality is a fiction. This is not contradicted by physics. If, as physicists now say, space-time is doomed, then so also are its physical objects and their apparent causality. So are current theories of consciousness, such as the Integrated Information Theory IIT, of Giulio Tononi, or the Biological Naturalism of John Searle that identify consciousness with certain causal properties of physical systems in space-time. If physical objects such as neurons have no causal powers, then IIT identifies consciousness with a fiction, not a promising move. Moreover, causal computations are less powerful than computations that abandon causality. When IIT identifies consciousness with causal computations, it identifies consciousness with inferior computations. Why should consciousness be inferior? What principled insight about consciousness dictates this dubious claim? The fictive nature of physical causality makes it tricky to construct the elusive theory of everything. Under course, we must first postulate a theory of our interface and of its various levels of data compression and error correction. Then we can use this theory to ask what, if anything, we can infer about the objective reality from the structures we see in the interface. If we can't infer anything, then we must postulate a theory of objective reality and predict how it appears in our theories to make empirical predictions that can be tested by careful experiments. I suspect that if we succeed in this enterprise, we will find that the distinction we make between the living and non-living is an artifact of limitations of our space-time interface, not an insight into the nature of reality. We will find a unified description of reality, animate and inanimate, once we take into account the limits of our interface, we will also find that networks of neurons are among our symbols for error correcting coders. In ITP, we can visualize the link between perception and action in a simple diagram. Shown in figure 10, in which an agent interacts with the world. The rounded box at the top of the diagram represents the world outside the agent. I won't claim for now to know anything about this world. In particular, I won't assume that it has a space, time, or objects. I'll simply say that this mysterious world has many states, whatever they may be, that can change. The agent, for its part, has a repertoire of experiences and actions shown in rounded boxes. Based on its current experience, the agent decides whether and how to change its current choice of action. This decision is depicted by the arrow labeled decide, under quotes. The agent then acts on the world, as depicted by the arrow labeled ACT, under quotes. The action of the agent changes the state of the world. The world, in response, changes the experience of the agent, as depicted by the arrow labeled PERCEIVE, under quotes. Perception and action are thus linked in a PERCEIVE-DECIDE 
Act PDA under quotes loop, which is described mathematically in the appendix. Figure 10. The perceive, decide, act PDA loop. Natural selection shifts this loop so that experiences guide actions that enhance fitness. The PDA loop is shared by an essential feature of evolution, the fitness pay of functions. The fitness of an action depends on the state of the world, but also on the organism, the agent, and its state. Each time an agent acts on the world, it changes the state of the world and reaps a fitness reward or punishment. Only an agent that acts in ways that reap enough fitness rewards will survive and reproduce. Natural selection favors agents with PDA loops properly tuned to fitness. For such an agent, its perceive arrow sends its messages about fitness and its experiences represent these messages about fitness. The messages and experiences are all about fitness, not about the state of the world. The experiences of the agent become an interface, not perfect but good enough. It guides actions that glean enough fitness points to survive long enough to rear offspring. Each agent has been molded through generations of ruthless selection to decide on actions that lead to desirable payoffs in fitness. The reproductive imperative that one must act in ways that collect enough fitness points to raise offspring coerces the coordination of perception, decision, and action. Those who lack this coordination suffer a pathetic proclivity to die young. Those who possess this coordination enjoy perceptions that form a useful interface and actions that link properly to that interface. Experiences and actions are not free. The larger your repertoire, the more calories you need. So there are selection pressures to keep these repertoires small. But if your repertoires are too small, you may lack essential data about fitness or critical actions that could enhance fitness. Different agents evolve different solutions, different ways to balance the competing forces of selection. Humans probably have a larger repertoire of experiences than beetles. Beers have a larger repertoire of olfactory experiences than humans. There is no consumer solution, just workable schemes that let agents survive in available niches. But in all solutions, the repertoire of experiences and actions is small compared to the complexity of the relevant fitness payoffs. All messages about fitness that an agent perceives must compress information about fitness into a manageable size and useful format without losing critical information and messages should allow an agent to find and correct errors. For instance, you are strolling along a sidewalk at dusk and suddenly jump in fear. You peer around to find a culprit and relax when you discern a garden hose in the grass. Your jump was triggered by a fitness message with inadequate error correction it incorrectly said snake on the course. Because this message didn't waste time on error correction, it arrived quickly and you acted promptly to avoid a fitness reducing bite. After your initial startle, an error corrected message arrived saying, no worries, just a hose on the course. Your needless jump wasted calories and triggered stress inducing cortisol, so it slightly paired your fitness. But in the long run, such quick and fallible messages stroke your fitness by slashing the risk of a mortal bite. If you trafficked only in plodding but reliable messages, then you'd hasten the day that you correctly learn you've just been bitten on the course. Correct, but less helpful. This illustrates that there are multiple solutions to the problem of compressing and correcting fitness messages. We can expect that natural selection has shaped a variety of solutions tailored to the vagaries of fitness and that a single organism may embody multiple solutions for its different fitness needs. But we can also expect to find similar solutions across species because evolution, in the process of speciation, will often repurpose rather than redesign. We see repurposing in the intel unintelligent design of our eyes. Light that passes through the lens of the eye must negotiate a gauntlet of blood vessels and interneurons before it chances on a photoreceptor at the back of the retina. All vertebrates suffer this clutch, suggesting that it cropped up early in vertebrate evolution and was never corrected. The clutch is unnecessary. Cephalopods, such as the octopus and squid, get things right. Their photoreceptors sit in front of the interneurons and blood vessels. We can see error correction in real time in the visual example shown in figure 11. On the left are two black discs with white cutouts. On the right, these discs are rotated 
so that their cutouts align. Suddenly, you see more than discs with cutouts. You see a glowing line that floats in front of the discs. You can check that you create the glow between the discs. Cover the disc with your thumbs and the glow disappears. You can think of the glowing line as your correction of an erasure. It's as though your visual system decides that the actual message that was sent was a straight line, but that part of the line got erased in transmission. It corrects the error by filling in the gap with a glowing line. This is similar to error correction in a simple hemming under quotes, code that can send only two messages. Those are 00, 000, 000 or 111. If the receiver gets, say, 101, then it knows that there was an error, that the middle one got erased. So it fixes the eraser and arrives at the message 111. This hemming code uses three bits to send just one bit of information. So it allows the receiver to detect and correct one erasure error. By correcting the erasure in the image of black disks, you recover a message, line in front of disks, on the course. You can also recover a second message, line behind disks, on the course. To see this message, think of the disks as holes in a sheet of white paper. You are looking through the holes, and behind the paper you see a line. Notice that when you see this line, the segment of the line between the disks no longer glows, but you still sense that it's there. Which line is there, glowing or not glowing, when you don't look? The question is of course silly. There is no line when you don't look. Instead, the line you see is the message you recover when you correct an erasure. Let's ask a different question. Which line will you see, glowing or not, when you look? You can't be certain. Sometimes you'll see a line that glows, sometimes a line that does not. But you can guess probabilities. I see the glowing line more often. I would say that the probability is about three quarters that I will see it glowing and one quarter that I will see it not glowing. If someone demanded that I write down my probabilities in terms of states of the line, glowing or not glowing, then I would write down a superposition under quotes state for the line in which the glowing state has a three quarters probability and the not glowing state has a one quarter probability. This is analogous to the superposition of states that we encountered earlier in the quantum theory. Recall that according to cubism, a quantum state does not describe objective state of a world that exists even if no one looks, but rather it describes the beliefs of an agent about what she will see if she acts, or to put it more technically, what outcome she will obtain if she makes a measurement. Let's take this example a step further. In figure 12, there are, on the left side, four black disks with white cutouts. On the right, these same disks are rotated so that their cutouts align. Suddenly, you see more than disks with cutouts. You see four glowing lines that float in front of the disks. Each glowing line seems to continue through the blank space between disks. You can again check that you are creating the glow between disks by covering up two disks with your thumbs. The glow disappears. Your visual system has corrected four erasure errors and created four glowing lines, but it also detects another coded message at yet a higher level. It detects a square. It receives messages at different levels of abstraction, one-dimensional lines and a 2D square. Your correction of errors probably involves both levels at once. The evidence that the message is a square increases the confidence of your visual system in the evidence that the lines were erased and should be restored. Your visual system can detect a second message about a square. Again, think of the four black disks as holes in a white sheet of paper. And imagine that you're looking through these holes. Then behind the paper, you'll see a square. When you do, notice that its lines don't glow. You're confident that the lines are there, but they are hidden by the white paper. So you can get two different messages about a square from this figure. One message has the square in front with glowing lines. The second message has the square in back with lines that don't glow. Notice that all four lines glow, or else all four lines do not glow. You never see, say, two lines glowing and, and two not glowing. Why? Because your visual system has united all four lines into a single unified message, or a square. It has entangled on the quotes the four lines into a single object so that what happens to one line must happen to all 
Now let's take our example one final step. In figure 13, there are on the left, eight black discs with white cutouts. On the right, these same discs are rotated so that their cutouts align. Suddenly you see 12 glowing lines. You have corrected 12 erasers of lines. Figure 13, correcting an erased cube. The visual system creates a cube over the eight discs on the right to correct an erasure error. But now you do something radical. You entangle these lines to form a single object, a cube, and in the process, you create a new dimension of depth. You start with information in two dimensions and then inflate it holographically into three dimensions. Entanglement in this example is intimately linked with the creation of a conscious experience of three dimensions of space. Notice that sometimes you see a cube with corner A in front and other times you see one with a corner B in front. When you flip from one cube to the other, you reverse the relationships of depth in three dimensions that you holographically construct. Lines that were in front go to the back and vice versa. The other lines are all entangled can again be verified by noting, for instance, that they all glow when the cube is seen in front of the disk and they all cease to glow when the cube is seen as behind the disks. In quantum theory, work by Mark Van Ramsdonk, Brian Swingle and others indicates that space-time is woven together from threads of entanglement. I suspect that there is more than mere analogy here. I suspect that superposition, entanglement and holographic inflation of three dimensions seen in our visual example is precisely the same as studied in quantum theory. Space-time is not an objective reality independent of any observer. It is an interface shared by natural selection to convey messages about fitness. In the visual example of the cube, we see this space-time interface in action, complete with error correction, superposition, entanglement, and holographic inflation. Shaded disks, the random shading of the left disk and the uniform shading of the middle disk makes them look flat. The shading of the right disk makes it look like a sphere. Convex and concave disks, we assume that the light source is overhead. Another way you inflate two dimensions into three is shown in figure 14. On the left is a disk which the brightness of each point is chosen at random. You just see noise. In the middle is a disk of constant brightness which looks flat. But on the right is a disk in which the brightness varies gradually and systematically. Now the magic happens. You inflate the disk into a sphere. Even though the information is 2D, you holographically inflate it into a 3D object. Sometimes, as shown in figure 15, you inflate a shape that is convex, and other times you inflate one that is concave. Your visual system prefers to inflate a shape in such a way that it appears to be lit from overhead. In addition to inflating gradients of brightness, you also inflate curves, as shown in figure 16. On the left is a disk with a grid of straight lines, which looks flat. In the middle, the lines are curved slightly, and you inflate a sphere. On the right, curved lines and gradients of brightness are combined, and you inflate a compelling sphere. Figure 16. Inflating the third dimension, we sometimes interpret curving contours as a shape with depth in three dimensions. What do we learn from these examples of lines, squares, cubes, and spheres? According to the standard vision science, they show us how the visual system reconstructs the true shapes of real objects in an objective space-time. According to ITP, they show us something entirely different, how the visual system decodes messages about fitness. There is no objective space-time and no pre-existing objects in space-time whose true properties we try to recover. Instead, space-time and objects are simply a coding system for messages about fitness. The visual examples we have just seen in which we catch ourselves inflating information from two dimensions into three don't show that objective reality has two dimensions rather than three. Instead, they are intended to weaken our conviction that space-time itself is an aspect of objective reality. The examples have two dimensions simply to fit on the page. If a fitness message is corrupted by a little noise, then the system can sometimes correct the error as we saw with those glowing lines. If the noise is too great, as in the disk whose pixels have random brightnesses, then we cannot correct the error. We see noise with no clear fitness message. But if brightness and contours convey a consistent message, then we often decode that message into a language of 3D shapes that is tailored to guide adaptive action. 
We see, for instance, a sphere and thereby know how to grasp it or avoid it. We see an apple and know that grasping and eating it can enhance our fitness. We see a leopard and know that the same actions are unwise. In short, we do not recover the true shape in three dimensions of a pre-existing object. There are no such objects. Instead, we recover a message of our fitness that happens to use shapes in three dimensions as a coding language. Once we know the rules that human vision uses to decode messages about fitness, we can use those rules to send the messages we want. Consider genes. They often have finishes, sanded by hand or etched by a laser, that are intended to mimic wear and tear. These finishes have brightness gradients, like the brightness gradients of the sphere in figure 16, that convey a message about a shape in three dimensions. Genes also have curved contours, pockets, seams, and yokes. Like the curves of the sphere in figure 16, these convey a message about a shape in three dimensions. Darren Peshek and I found that by carefully arranging these curves and finishes, we could alter the perceived shape to convey another message about fitness, that the body wearing the jeans is attractive. This led to a new line of clothing known as body optics. Clothing, like makeup, can send carefully crafted messages with a few white lies about fitness. Enhancing the body with jeans, the left side looks flat, the right side looks firm and toned. The difference is due to the careful use of visual cues for depth. This is illustrated by the pair of jeans in figure 17. This image can be viewed in full color in the color insert as figure A. On its left side, the jean has a standard construction and finish. On its right side, it has a construction and finish carefully designed to convey the message of a well-toned, attractive body. The left side looks flat, the right side shapely and toned. One person wears the jeans, but their two sides differ sharply in apparent shape and attractiveness. In sum, space-time is not an ancient theater erected long before any stirrings of life. It is a data structure that we create now to track and capture fitness payoffs. Physical objects such as peers and planets are not antique stage props in place long before consciousness took the stage. They too are data structures of our making. The shape of a peer is a code that describes fitness payoffs and suggests actions I might take to ingest them. Its distance coerces my energy cost to reach it and snatch it. We inflate space-time and construct objects with carefully crafted shapes. But then we add a flourish. We paint these shapes with colors and textures. Why? Because colors and textures code critical data on fitness, as we will explore in the next, next chapter. chapter.